Okay, let's get going, shall we? This week on the shop build, I'm going to be doing the rough-in wiring as well as the spray foam insulation. Bringing in power to this building has been a very hot question in the comment section since starting. So let me cover the big picture and then I'll get into details. I have an existing power pole about 500 feet from the shop and I'm working with my electrical company on getting a new pole set closer to the shop with a transformer so that I could then bring in a new 200 amp service to supply power to the building. This is quite the process. To get the pole set, I first have to clear a 20-foot easement for the electrical company. Thankfully, all of the trees in the pathway are cedar, so I didn't have an issue with cutting them down and hauling them off. If you don't know, cedars take up a lot of groundwater and make it difficult for other species of trees to thrive. There's my pole! With that cleared, it will now be between six to eight weeks before the new power pole is set. Uh, the lines are gonna be aerial from pole to pole. Then from the, the new pole, it'll be direct buried into the shop. When the slab was poured, a conduit pipe was placed in the side of the shop since I knew I would be bringing in power on this side. And of course, once the new pole is set, I will record the process on connecting power from the pole to the shop. But even without the pole, I can still move to the inside and start on the rough-in wiring. I did hire two electricians for the wiring. However, I volunteered myself as their extra hand so that I could still be a part of the process and also learn everything I could. We started by attaching all of the outlet boxes and I wanted outlets everywhere. And then I wanted some more. I wanted a 120 outlet every six feet and at least four 240 outlets on every single wall. Since I'm going with three quarter inch wall sheathing later on, we had to use a spacer to offset these outlet boxes instead of relying on the shoulders that come attached to them. So just something to consider if you're gonna be sheathing your walls in something other than standard drywall. Next, we started drilling holes in the studs to run the Romex Simple wiring. This is a product made by Southwire and I'm very proud to be working with Southwire as they make such great quality products. What I'm using in my shop can be found at most of your local big box stores. The cable is coated with a patented simple cable jacket for easier pulling and stripping. It also resists tearing and reduces burn through. I'm using the yellow 12-2 Romex wire for my 120 outlets that will be ran on a 20 amp breaker. And the orange 10-2 wire for the 240 outlets that will use a 30 amp breaker. Now I'm wiring off a rough idea on how I want my shop set up currently. So for example, I want all of my machines set up against one wall and I want my dust collector stored outside. But I still tried to leave myself plenty of flexibility in the wiring in case I wanna move things around in the future. I'm also considering machines that I might get in the future that I don't currently have. So I wired in two dedicated 30 amp circuits even though I don't have any equipment that pulls that much of a load right now. And I wired in two runs of number six wiring in both shops that can support up to a 50 amp breaker. On that note, I also ran a dedicated number six line for the HVAC, which I'll add later on. So I went ahead and ran it through the wall, then just coiled up around 30 feet or so and left it up in the attic. The panel itself was placed over in the woodworking shop, so most of the runs in the woodworking space are ran through the studs, which is a little bit more time consuming to do. However, whenever we moved over to the metal shop side, most of those runs go vertical on the stud bays, then are ran through the ceiling over to the panel. However, instead of taking a diagonal shot to the panel, we would keep the wires running parallel to the walls. And this ensures plenty of wire if things ever need to be moved around in the future and it keeps the center of the attic space clear. Moving up to the covered patio, I wanted to make sure that I would also have plenty of outlets out here for when I wanted to work outside. Also, I'll be storing my dust collector outside so I made sure to set up a dedicated plug for that while I was at it. I placed multiple 120 and 240 outlets outdoors using an angle grinder with a diamond tip blade to cut through the concrete board, then finishing off the cut with a recip saw. <laughs> While this stuff is not fun to cut through, I do think it's easier to install the siding hole than make the cuts. The last thing that we had to wire for is the lights. We went ahead and placed an outlet receptacle at every light so that I could not only plug the light fixture in, but also have multiple options for plugging in cord reels. To control the lights, I'm gonna be having a three-way switch at every entry exit point. All of the woodworking lights will be on one circuit and all of the metal will be on another. Also, there will be a wall sconce light outside of every single man door. And for these, I plan to just leave them on all the time and then have a fixture that has a solar sensor on it so that it will control when it comes on and off. 
Now at this point, all of the wires run back to the panel, but nothing is terminated right now. I will of course be doing another video whenever I move to doing the finish work on the inside, uh, when I hook up the power to the pole, and also when I terminate everything to the breakers. Before moving on, uh, the last little bit to do was to staple all of the wiring to the studs, especially since I was going with spray foam insulation, because that spray foam will expand and move those wires around. It was my intention to run all of my speaker wire, a Cat5 and even a Coax line before spray foam. However, I very quickly ran out of time. So instead, what I did was place a few pieces of conduit throughout the shop so that I can have a clear cut path to run these wires later on. Oh, and then the last thing I did before moving on to insulation is I took a video of the entire shop space so that I could document where all of my wires were before they get covered up. Okay. So let's get on to insulation. It was my intention to go with fiberglass bats, which is why I left in a four inch ridge vent whenever I did the roofing step. However, I switched over to foam when I had the unbelievable opportunity to work with SES Foam, who is a leading manufacturer in the spray foam industry. Spray foam is without a doubt the most efficient way to insulate because it not only utilizes thermal resistant qualities, but it also stops air movement. And the U.S. Department of Energy says that air infiltration is the cause of like 40% of energy loss in homes. That's huge. So to prepare for the insulation, installation of the insulation, <laughs> I first needed to block off the stud bay cavities at the top of the walls leading out to the covered patio. This blocking can be made from just about anything since it won't be seen once I deck the underside of the patio. It could be made from cardboard, foam, or even plastic, but I went with the leftover lap siding material. It just so happened to work out that I simply needed to cut it to length to fit into the space and I could use two nails to secure it. Also, since I wanted that center wall to be insulated, mostly to try to kill some noise from shop to shop, I had to also sheathe at least one side. At this point, the insulation crew showed up to start prepping the space for the next day's event, so I was hustling. Since the spray foam has an overspray, the crew worked on taping off my doors, windows, and even my floor while I finished up this wall. On that note, I think it's important that if you're going to go the spray foam route to not only get a good quality spray foam, but also get a good quality contractor. The next morning they started spraying at 7 a.m. and it was fascinating to watch. Now I didn't want to run the risk of getting spray foam on my DSLR, so all my footage is taken from my iPhone. And since I don't have lights yet, it is a little dark, so bear with me. The crew had two guys spraying and filling up the stud bays with the spray foam. And watching the foam get laid and expand is very mesmerizing. It's also easy to see why it does the best job at stopping air movement. This stuff finds any and all holes and seals it up, as seen on these outlet boxes and even the blocking that I put up going to the covered patio. They would overfill the bays just slightly then another guy would come back with a pneumatic tool with a wire brush on it to knock the foam completely flush with the studs. After the first pass, they would double back and fill in any low spots or voids. For the ceiling, they did what is referred to as a hot roof, where they sprayed foam directly to the underside of the roof decking. And as you can see, they went ahead and filled in that ridge vent that I put in earlier. I wasn't, I wasn't very familiar with spray foam before this, so I asked a lot of questions while the contractor was here. To kind of give you an overview, there are two different types of spray foam. Open cell, which is referred to as half pound, and closed cell, which is also called two pound. And this is the weight per cubic foot. What I have is the half pound or open cell. And as I mentioned earlier, I am very fortunate enough to be working with SES Foam on this. They are a leading manufacturer in the industry with a patented formula that uses sugar as a fire retardant. This spray foam, as it's laid down, is naturally fire retardant. That means I don't have to come back and add an additional fire suppressant. Now for the R value, open cell foam has an R value of about 3.6 per inch. To give you a comparison, fiberglass insulation has about 3.1. So my walls and attic have a total R value of around 21. If you were considering the two options, and here are a few tidbits that I found worth considering. Uh, one, keep in mind that fiberglass does allow air to move through it. So it relies solely on thermal resistance and does not provide an air barrier. On that note, spray foam is more expensive up front. However, it is also more efficient, which means that now I don't have to have such a big HVAC unit, which saves me money up front on the next step. Also, with it being more efficient, it's gonna be saving me monthly on my bills to heat and cool the space. 
If you're interested in finding out more information on SES foam, on spray foam in general, or if you'd be interested in using Thermodynamics, the contractor that I use, then I will leave you links to all three down below. A very quick wrap up for you. It took two days working with the electricians to do all of the rough wiring. It took me a single day to prepare for spray foam, a few hours for the guys to prep the space for insulation, and then about seven hours to do the entire workshop for insulation. I hope that y'all learned something. I certainly learned a lot this week. Um, next up is gonna be the ceiling and finishing the wall sheathing. So I will see you when I get it done.